Superhero movies and stories in the 20th and 21st century have certainly captured the attention of many. The Marvel Cinematic Universe, as well as Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, speak to the desire many Americans and others have towards superheroes. However, this development has not come without criticism. The superhero figure is not a mere warrior, but also a protector of people, institutions and nations. Due to the American nature of the superhero genre, this is interpreted as protecting American interest groups and government bodies. The ramifications of this are immense. The 21st century in the United States, but also in Australia and Britain, has featured the war against terror, the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan, the global financial crisis, and increasing crime in urban areas. In response, many Anglo protest movements have sought to oppose these developments, such as Occupy Wall Street, Wikilinks, and general activism against capitalism and student loans. Therefore, it comes at no surprise that many see the contemporary superhero as complicit in these economic and political issues. This criticism I find to be particularly prominent on the left, with video essayists such as Pop Culture Detective and Second Thoughts taking to task the glorification of American military power and the economic inconsistencies throughout the United States. Personally, I welcome this. Not because I share their political position, which I don't, but because I too share their concerns. However, I disagree with the common stance coming from left-wing spaces about superhero stories. There's an emphasis on superheroes defending the status quo, an approach disliked by many leftists. In this video, I will explain why superheroes defend the status quo and why they have to. I'll cite examples from history, geopolitics and storytelling. Not everyone will agree with my stance. However, I hope to provide a unique perspective to ongoing discussions about superheroes. I'm Madeline Rose Jones and I help you understand the world through fiction. Subscribe for frequent videos about history, literature and culture. Welcome to Snowy Fictions. Argument 1. Superheroes have no right to change the status quo. The United States of America claims to be a beacon of democracy, a nation proud of having elections at the state and federal level. Within the wider Anglosphere, there is a strong legal tradition of individualism and human rights. One is obviously the right to vote. The current mode and philosophy of democracy in the United States is not without controversy. However, it's the system most superheroes work in. The Anglosphere deserves a special note, as these countries truly do value freedom and liberty. We don't take kindly to cruel dictators like Stalin and are happy to bring attention to human rights concerns in Afghanistan and Syria. There's a strong skepticism towards cults of personality, hence why many Americans struggle with North Korean dictators. The four-year Trump presidency is a minor exception to this rule, and many English language journalists portray Trump as a ghoulish dictator. The point being, superheroes are already misfits in America. Beyond law-breaking, I'm not sure Americans or English speakers would take kindly to a superhero trying to change the status quo. Radical change, particularly of political and economic systems, would antagonize the public in remarkable ways. This is made even more complicated when superheroes are anonymous or are not bound by consequences. In fact, part of the appeal of Iron Man or Batman was their refusal to adhere to legal codes of the day. To someone like Bruce Wayne, the law and political structures 
have failed ordinary people. However, this rebellious attitude can only take the hero so far. I don't see a scenario where it is morally desirable for superheroes to radically change the status quo. I imagine if such a universe where a superhero population existed, there would be public debates over their limits of power, not too similar from the fates inflicted onto monarchs and churches. Overall, Americans like democracy and want to feel in charge of their fate. Superheroes are perilous to this idea. To those who desire radical and revolutionary superheroes, I'm interested in the emphasis you place on democracy and the social contract. Because to me, there's nothing democratic about superheroes. Their mere existence challenges left-wing notions on equality too. Hardly any human can match the intelligence and wealth of Tony Stark. Likewise, Spider-Man's physical abilities give a sophisticated edge to anything he does. In terms of raw power, superheroes can crush ordinary humans and inflict their will. To badly paraphrase Stalin, superheroes are the engineers of both the tank and the human soul. The fact superheroes are mostly disinterested in changing the status quo is a relief to those living in these fictional universes. Argument 2. The Monstrous Risks Change is unpredictable. No single man or woman has complete control over it. Whilst Hollywood certainly loves its mastermind plots and scheming villains, the narrative arc of history explores these limitations. For example, Karl Marx had a certain vision of communism, yet their implementation and overall success of these ideas differed. This is widely true for intellectual, religious and political history. It's all very good to have weapons and very strong and sophisticated ideas, but this doesn't mean they will succeed especially during the unpredictable theatres of war. A superhero can only mitigate these risks so much. To change the status quo would risk a huge backlash. One key point of the Marvel Cinematic Universe was the emphasis on diplomacy and international relations, particularly seen in the Captain America movies. Here. Audiences are exposed to the fragile machinery of international law and politics. It's certainly delicate, and I question whether it is wise for superheroes to meddle in it too much. In many ways, superheroes challenge our core beliefs about World War II governance, which alluded to the possibility of global cooperation. This dream at least in Western Europe and the Anglosphere, was strengthened by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union. Superheroes are certainly blunt in their approaches and methods. To me, this challenges core tenets of diplomacy. Quite interestingly, superheroes reveal the flaws in this world order. For one, international bodies such as the United Nations, are quite powerless and can get hijacked by bad actors. Two, the need for hard power is necessary to end conflict. Where superheroes diverge from radical political philosophies on the left and the right is that they have more faith in these systems. Hydra, as seen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is portrayed as a ghastly and subversive force which invaded the honourable Atlantic institutions. A superhero must fight Hydra, but ultimately there's little to address the weak ideologies and structures which allowed Hydra to initially succeed. Heroes don't do this for two reasons. A. They don't know how. And B. It's too risky regarding geopolitical backlash and further escalation and more importantly, it's not their job. 
The American superhero was always about heart and physical power. They are good for maintaining structures and ideas, or enforcing them onto others, but not to develop and build them from nothing. This limitation also explains why superheroes stick to the status quo, as really, it's the only thing they know. Argument 3. Human Nature So often, in political discourse, especially from left-wingers, there's an emphasis on systemic problems. This can range from poverty, to crime and to social relations between different groups. To many in the left, systematic problems are embedded into our daily life and are found in schools, workplaces, the police force, entertainment and the political sphere. However, I ultimately diverge from this thought here, as I'd argue human nature has built these systems. It is difficult to see humanity as capable of not creating or engaging in systematic problems. Practices of decolonization and anti-racism would require ongoing work which simply never finishes. This is made complicated when humans are not created equal. For example, men will always be physically stronger than women, therefore, the military and associated armed forces will have a masculine characteristics. We know humans are fond of hierarchical structures and societies. Whilst I encourage discussion about discrimination and unfairness, we must accept these core tenets of human nature and seek to minimise evil. That said, changing nations for the better often does require systematic change but I doubt whether superheroes are suitable for that task. The point is to work with these systems, not to abolish or radically change them. It's best for superheroes to not engage in changing systematic inequalities because they frequently require long-term solutions, debate and working with communities, many which have varying perspectives. As you can see, this demands an excellent grasp on cultural awareness and diplomacy, which superheroes may not have. Argument 4. Benevolence matters. All of this leaves the superhero limited in the change he or she can enforce. Superheroes save the world. They don't necessarily change it. That's partially why there's an emphasis on benevolence or small acts of charity. The best example is Tony Stark or Bruce Wayne's philanthropy. A small community-based NGO may enjoy donations and their support, yet they won't achieve their ultimate goals regarding systemic change. Superhero stories love benevolence. Peter Parker's goodness isn't just shown in his heroic acts of saving the day, but in his friendships and community work. This ultimately stresses an important point about superheroes. They defend people, not systems. However, I understand the frustration towards benevolence. In our own reality, many corrupt individuals hide behind small acts of charity to obscure sinister intentions. These little acts of kindness can appear as breadcrumbs, yet the fault doesn't lie within the superheroes but within those ill-motivated groups and people. So often in superhero fiction, there's an emphasis on the hero's pure heart and good nature. This matters because the audience will admire the hero's acts of courage and kindness. As this is expressed through benevolent acts, perhaps there is an implication that goodness and heroism is shown in small acts. I'm not against this myself, but I can see why others are. However, small acts of kindness do motivate the audience in believing they too can be heroic and remarkable through the decisions they make and the resources they have. Is it simplistic? Sure. Yet the success of the superhero genre among millennials, Zoomers and Generation X proved a hunger towards these benevolent acts. This might be the result of audiences identifying with both the hero 
and the individuals in peril. Young people today embody both activism and helplessness. Whether this is a wise is another discussion, but it is understandable for a well-educated demographic with limited economic power. Finally, I must address villains. Typically in English language storytelling, villains are far more revolutionary and radical than their heroic opponents. This was certainly the case in Black Panther and The Dark Knight Rises. In contrast, the heroes are more tepid and restrained in their approach, preferring non-violent solutions and not engaging in political concerns. I understand those who bemoan this. However, I must emphasise storytelling structure. Both The Hero's Journey and Save the Cat, as promoted by Joseph Campbell and Blake Snyder, are conservative in their restrained approach to politics. For the hero to save the day and themselves, they must embark on a journey of internal self-discovery. Here, the attention is shifted away from the environment and setting and towards the characters' flaws and false beliefs they must overcome. Superhero stories offer little space for the political reflection leftists desire. When the Marvel Cinematic Universe does delve into politics, the end result is awkward storytelling, where the film is too ironic and insincere for the messages many are hungry for. Thus, superhero films will always imply any radical change is catastrophic because there's little incentive to diverge from this. The conflation between change and catastrophe is frustrating, but it's certainly present in much if not all of genre fiction. This raises an urgent question for left-wingers. Is the superhero genre suitable to explore and promote their worldview? I just don't see an escape from the archetypical nature of superhero or fantasy fiction. Nor should we. There's a reason why these stories have re resonated throughout generations. The pioneers of political fiction, such as Aldous Huxley, Margaret Atwood, George Orwell, and Michelle Hulebeck, rarely use Save the Cat or The Hero's Journey. Again, while I don't share the politics of Second Thoughts, or pop culture detective, I do sympathise with their alienation regarding blockbuster media. Thank you for watching. If you'd like, please subscribe. Perhaps you'd like to consider my classes on creative writing linked below. I'll see you soon. Thanks again for watching.